And I want to introduce you to Allison Young and Rebecca Johnson, who are both from the Cal Academy. Come to talk to us today a little bit about our iNaturalist app. Uh, Allison Young is the co-director of the Center for Biodiversity and Community at the California Academy of Science, where she works to build community around nature connection and biodiversity documentation. Allison is co-lead of the annual City Nature Challenge, an international event that engages people around the world in a four-day bio blitz to find and record the nature in the cities. She and her co-director also run Snapshot Cal Coast, a yearly campaign to mobilize the public to document species along the California co coastline. Allison's background is in marine biology. She holds a master's in biology from Humboldt State University. Her research focused on the potential effects of climate change on California's rocky intertidal communities. And Rebecca Johnson co-directs the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science of the Cal Academy of Sciences, where she is also a research associate in the Department of Invertebrate Zoology and Geology. For most of her academic career, she has focused on color pattern of evolution and untangling the evolutionary history of nudibranches. In her current work, she supports and grows a community of naturalists working together to discover nature and collect important species occurrence data. She is passionate about building coalitions around place-based nature connection, biodiversity, documentation, and using species observations to understand climate change. Welcome, Rebecca and Allison. Hey there, thanks Hi, so much everyone. for having us. <laughs> Hi, nice thanks for having us um, this afternoon. I know you all have had a long day. Um, so thanks, and we're super happy to be here and talk about a little bit about our work and iNaturalist and especially how you might be able to use iNaturalist as a tool um, for some of the projects actually that we were just hearing you all describe on the, the tail end or just in your regular lives, but as part of your work um, through the Academy. Um, we want this to be, we're gonna give a, a short a presentation, but we want it to be pretty interactive. So if you have questions, uh, maybe you can type them in the chat or raise your hand and whichever one of us isn't talking, we'll try to monitor so we can um, answer questions because we want you all to get the most out of this as you can, not just us um, talking at you. Exactly, so I'm gonna um, share my screen and let's see here, let's bring up, let's see here, we'll do the whole, desktop so that I can make sure. There we go. And let me move into present mode. I'm sorry if I keep looking this way. I have a second screen over here. So like Zoom's here. <laughs> but of course, I don't have a camera on this screen over here. So I'm going to be looking sideways a little bit. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with this presentation and give you guys, um, I know I went out with you guys uh, for your very first field trip out to Judge John Sutter uh, shoreline and uh, had a chance, like a very, very quick little um, overview about iNaturalist um, on that day, but didn't really have a chance to kind of dive into it and really show you how to use it. Um, and how it's used um, and things like that as well. So we really wanna kind of give you a deeper dive. And like Rebecca said, um, it very well could be a really useful tool in some of the projects you guys are thinking about. So we really wanna connect, help you guys or help think about what are, what are some connections between the projects you guys are interested in doing um, and how iNaturalist could be used potentially um, to help enhance or you know, uh, actually do those projects as well. Um, so like Phoenix said, we're the co-directors of the Center for Biodiversity and Community Science at the Academy. Uh, we sit in the research department or the research division of the Academy as well. Um, but really our work is all about um, getting people to document biodiversity all around them, to build communities of people who are interested in nature and who are interested about wanting to learn more about nature, um, connecting those people to each other. Uh, and then the data that uh, are, are captured by, you know, our community scientists and the people who come out to our events and things like that to actually translate those um, so that they're used for science and, and management and, and conservation and policy as well. Um, so today we're really going to be talking kind of about kind of the, the suite of things that we end up doing with iNaturalist and potentially how you guys can do them too. Um, but first to start off with, I want to do it, like I said, a little bit, a little bit more of an explanation for what iNaturalist actually is, because um, we had to do it very quickly uh, the first time I met you all. Um, so iNaturalist is uh, both a website and an app, both free, uh, a platform uh, designed for people to make and share observations of the natural world. So here's some screenshots. This is from the Android app. If you have an iPhone, it looks a little different. Rebecca is actually going to show, uh, share her iPhone app. Um, in just a little bit, so you'll have a chance to kind of see the differences. But basically what iNaturalist allows you to do is to 
um, take photos of organisms that you see around you uh, to get help with identifications on what those organisms are, to help you keep track of all the things that you have seen and, and documented, and that also be able to explore um, other observations that people have made in particular places or around the entire world, since iNaturalist is an international and, and global um, application. So how does it work? Um, basically, uh, the reason we really love using it in our work is that you don't actually have to know what it is that you're observing, uh, which really kind of helps democratize this, uh, this ability to go out there and document the species around you, because all you have to do is take a good photo of something. Um, in this case, this is a, a nudibranch. Rebecca and I are both marine biologists, so we spend a lot of time out on the coast. And there's a lot of yellow nudibranchs out there on the coast that are different species. Um, so you can see uh, the first panel is the photo that I've taken. Um, in the iNaturalist app, you can see the little, the little thumbnail of it there. iNaturalist records where you are when you took that photo, it records the date when you took that photo as well. Um, and what it does is that when you tap that little um, unknown view suggestions button up there, it gives you suggestions for what it is it thinks that you saw. It has this artificial intelligence or computer vision in the app as long as you have a a cellular connection or a, a Wi-Fi connection. Um, and it gives you uh, suggestions for what it thinks that, that it is that you just saw. So you can see it's telling me that it's pretty sure it's in this one genus. Um, and then it has uh, some top suggestions based on what this thing looks like and also what's been seen nearby me as well. And you can see there's quite a few of those yellow nudibranchs that are, that are visually similar and seen nearby. Um, but in this case, I picked that first one, the sea lemon, the Peltodorus nobilis as well. Um, and then once you... Uh, choose what species you think it is, you can upload it to iNaturalist and share with the community um, where they can re refine and, and like figure out if you pick the right identification. So really quickly, I wanna show, Rebecca is gonna show, um, let me stop sharing this and we're gonna, she's gonna share her phone really quickly and actually show in real time, like how does this actually work? Like how do you get those suggestions and things like that? So I'm gonna turn it back over to Rebecca. All right, so I am going to share my screen. And let's see if it works. This is from my phone, so it should share with all of you. So you should be able to see my screen. And I'm gonna show you just how to make an observation on iNaturalist. So here's my phone. Now it's like you're looking at my phone screen. So if I choose the iNaturalist app, oops, you can see all of my observations that I've made, um, just like you saw in the screenshots that Allison showed earlier. So when you open up the iNaturalist app, this is what it shows, um, your name, what's your user login and all of the things that you've seen. And down at the bottom, you can see it has this explore tab, activity tab, observe, and then we're on me right now. So if you wanna make an observation, you click observe. And I'm gonna take a picture, I'm gonna show you, I pick some plants from my garden. And then you can see it asks you, do you wanna just make an observation with no photo? which you can um, if you wanna just document or remember that you saw something and you didn't get a photo of it, like a really cool hawk flew over, like a red tail hawk, and you wanna remember that you saw it, like where you saw it on that day. Even if you don't have a photo, you can say no photo and um, say you saw that hawk. I'm gonna choose now though, I'm gonna choose camera. And then my camera comes on and I'm gonna take a picture of this little flower and a big flower actually. So I wanna take a pretty clear photo. This is, it's, it's in my house. It's a little different than being in nature, but this is from my backyard. So um, we say use photo and you can see the next screen. It has the photo that I took. It says, what did you see in view suggestions? It has the date and time and it has the location. I live right across from the street from a park in San Francisco. And so it always says my location is this park. Um, and so that's the information that we need to understand when and where this, this plant was seen. But if we wanna know what, what I saw we can, and view suggestions based on the, the computer vision, like Allison was talking about, we just click view suggestions. And then this is the computer vision thinking. And you can see it makes these, these suggestions here. It says it's not confident to make a recommendation, but here are the, their top, the top suggestions. And you can see it has this common mallow and it says that is, for the first handful of these, right, it all says that they're visually similar and seen nearby. And I have this down at the very bottom, I have this toggle on to say only show nearby suggestions. 
So I only want it to show me suggestions that have been made like roughly within like 50 miles of where I am. I don't want suggestions from things that have been seen in China or Japan or Australia. If I click this off, actually, you can see that it increases the, the number of things and it changes them. Um, so we're going to leave it on nearby. And so I'm actually, this is planted in my, in my garden. I'm actually not sure what kind of malo, malva it is, but I know it's malva. So I can look here and say, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that it's malva. So I can type that in because that was what it, it was suggesting. Um, that's, that's what I'm going to choose, but I could have chosen those other suggestions. I'm going to show you another example. Um, by taking another, by choosing, let's, I'll take one more photo of this other flower, this lavender. And actually I took that one photo, but I can take more than one photo and look at the other parts of the flower. So I'm gonna say, take another photo and I'm gonna take a picture of the leaves. So it has more than one part, sometimes, um, it's important to have more than one part to help in identification. But then I'm gonna say, what did I see? Oh my gosh, it's so funny. It's like, doesn't, I did this earlier and it's like making a very, very strange suggestion. So it thinks that it's an aphid. So let me try to take a better picture. Of this flower and we'll take it out of the mix. So it kind of shows the, the value of taking good, clear photos. Okay, so now it's suggesting that it's in the, it's a lavender and I know that it's a lavender and it's say that we're pretty sure this is in this genus. And so I'm gonna say, yep, I agree. And I say save. The other way that you can upload photos is by choosing things that you've already taken photos of by choosing photo library here. So I'm just gonna show you an example go back through some photos that I've taken. And when you do this, you can choose two, more than one photo, you can choose up to four photos. So I'm gonna choose these two of this plant that I saw out along the shoreline in Richmond. So as it pulls up this observation, you can see it's, I took this just a few days ago in Richmond. I'm gonna click, what did I see? And it will make suggestions. And it says it's pretty sure that's in this genus of, pick of pickle weeds. Um, and here are our top suggestions. Pacific, this is the Pacific glasswort or, or Pacific um, pickleweed or Virginia glasswort or Parrish's glasswort. So I know this is the Pacific glasswort, so I'm gonna choose that one. And I'm gonna say save. And then once you have these observations here, if you, when you wanna upload them to iNaturalist, you just click upload and then they're shared with the community. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can go back to Allison's presentation. And I'll just add as I'm getting my screen back up is that the default on iNaturalist is that it automatically uploads your observation. So if you've noticed that before, um, that you know when you go like Rebecca hit that upload button, um, but a lot of times you can tell it you can tell it on iNaturalist in your settings if you want it to automatically upload or if you want it to wait and, until you tell it to upload. Um, so Rebecca has that setting turned on. This says wait, you know, turn off the automatic upload, wait till I tell you to upload. Um, but if you use the iNaturalist app and you notice that automatically uploading, that's because that's the default setting as well. Um, so that was just a quick demonstration on what it looks like in the app to actually make an observation. And once you upload it, um, then what you're doing, let me click the screen so it knows I'm here. Um, then what you're actually doing is sharing that observation with the iNaturalist community. Um, and this is really the powerful part of iNaturalist is that it is designed to be a social network for people who are interested in nature. Um, and so you have folks that are like actual experts, you know, they're like botanists or ornithologists and they're on iNaturalist. Um, but you have people like amateur experts. There's a lot of people out there who've like taught themselves how to identify all the birds, you know, around them and things like that. Those folks are on iNaturalist. There's people who are just interested in, you know, to document things as they're out hiking, all the way down to folks that are like just getting interested in nature or like they see an interesting spider in their house and they're just like, do I have to worry about this spider? I'm going to take a photo, photo of it and put it up on iNaturalist. Let's figure out what it is. Um, so it's, it's designed for 
anyone who has any interest in nature at all. And all those folks who can make observations, they can make observations, but all those people also have the ability to share their expertise and help identify other people's observations as well. Um, so you don't have to be an expert to ID things. You can help in this process. Um, you know, if you, if you just know any, something about a, a species that you see someone's taking a photo of, you can weigh in and help with that identification. Um, so going back to that nudibranch that I had taken a photo of and showed you that uh, the screenshots of the Android app earlier, this is what that same observation looks like once I've uploaded it to iNaturalist. And you can see in this case, it has the date that I saw it on, it has the location where I saw it. Um, and then it also has, you can see that a few other people have weighed in and agreed that I picked the right suggestion. It is actually the sea lemon, this Peltodorus noblis. Um, and at that point, once there's an agreement on the identification, as long as there's like a two thirds agreement from the people who've weighed in and put and put down a species, um, this is what we now call a research grade observation. So a research grade observation just basically has, it has a date that seems correct. It has a location that seems correct. Um, it has evidence of the organism. So it has that photograph um, and two thirds of the people who who come in and put an ID on it, agree what species it is. And now this is a research grade observation. So. Uh, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, we work at the California Academy of Sciences and that photograph has now been turned into an actual data point. And we call those things a species occurrence record because it's evidence that that species occurred there at that particular place on that particular day. So it's a species occurrence record. The species was found here on this day. And that's the exact same information that we hold in our collections at the California Academy of Sciences and the other natural history museums and universities have as well. It's the same information when you look on a label, like on that poppy label um, on the left there. The label is basically telling you that same information. It's telling you where it was found, who was it that found it, what day it was found on. Um, and, and instead of a photograph, though, the evidence is that actual poppy itself. Um, but in the end, those are both species occurrence records. Just one is a photograph and one is an actual specimen. Um, and so we can use this information for lots of different things. Importantly, um, all the data on iNaturalist is open for anyone to explore. You can see there's um, close to 80 million observations that have been made all around the world by 1.8 million people sharing what they're seeing around them around the world. Um, and so this is a huge important data source, right, of where species are and anyone can go and examine this data and download it to help answer their questions um, about where species are being found. Those observations that make it to research grade, so the ones that people agree what species it is, get shared with this other database called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF for short. It makes it sound like it's a big building somewhere, but it really is. It's like a bunch of servers that just hold a bunch of species occurrence records. And so this has research grade observations for iNaturalist, but it also has like the specimens from the California Academy of Sciences, the database of, of those specimens and those collections. It also has records from eBird, which is another community science app for people to record birds that they're seeing around them, like just focus on birds. Um, and so really importantly, um, this, this database here gives you all this current information that's being collected by people all over the world on iNaturalist and th on things like eBird, but also gives you this historic data that's been collected by museums around the world for hundreds of years as well. Um, and so this, this, when you put this all together, it's a really important source of data to understand how things are changing, what things were found in the past and where they're being found right now. And this is one of the main uses of iNaturalist data actually, that you, know, you just might be out in your backyard taking a photo of an interesting you know, insect that you see on a flower and not really thinking about contributing to science or things like that. But that observation could be really important to answer somebody's question about where that species is occurring around the world. Um, and we know in 2020 that over 375 papers were written using data that was downloaded from GBIF, including iNaturalist data as well. Um, and so this really big data side of iNaturalist is one of the main ways that those data are used. Um, you know, whether or not you think you, you're, that you're, you're you know, meaning to contribute to science or not, um, every observation on iNaturalist could be important for lots of different reasons. One of the other really cool uh, uses of iNaturalist data uh, is for management purposes. Um, so when, let me close this thing that's up here. Um, so when you make observations on iNaturalist, those observations can be associated with places on iNaturalist as well. So people can make places on iNaturalist and say, I'm really interested in this, in this particular place and what pe things people are finding there. Um, so here's Lake Merritt, for example, um, over in Oakland, you can see over 14,000 observations have been made 
just in that boundary of Lake Merritt, which is really, really cool. Um, and one of the uh, reasons so many observations have been made there is that people have been really promoting, they've been holding events like bio blitzes and really promoting people making observations there, especially folks from the Rotary Nature Center um, and other people who have been working on the restoration of Lake Merritt. Um, so over the last you know, decade or so, people have been working on restoring the connection to the Bay of Lake Merritt and really been documenting like what are those species that are now returning to Lake Merritt as we've been um, you know, restoring the connection to the Bay and like making it you know, more habitable for more species. Um, and so folks are, who are interested in seeing the effects of restoration are using this data to be able to track you know, what, were we, what were we seeing 10 years ago and what are we seeing right now um, at Lake Merritt. And they're holding events like bio blitzes to get people out there and document the things that they're seeing um, and basically using this information to help better manage for the species that are there, right? To make better decisions based on you knowing what species are um, in Lake Merritt. Um, so when we look at uh, the Lake Merritt, Lake Merritt on iNaturalist, not only can we see all those dots, but we can actually see a species list. So um, before I pull up with the species that have been seen there. iNaturalist shows us, shows us the species from most observed. So it starts with the thing that has the most observations and eventually will show all 1100 species down to the things that, are, that have been only been seen once. In the chat, anyone wanna guess what you think the most observed species from Lake Merritt is? If any of you guys are familiar with that area, anyone have a thought about what people are making the most observations of? You can type it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and make a guess if you have a guess about what the most observed things in Lake Merritt have been. Migratory birds. Migratory birds. Birds is a yeah. really good example. We have pelicans, gulls, uh, lots of birds. A lot of people know that Lake Merritt's a great place to look for birds. So if we bring up the species list, oh, let me bring, go out of the chat. So the most observed, Thing, uh, at Lake Merritt, and most of the observed things are birds, the top observed things. Black crowned night herons are the most observed bird. Um, if you guys know that they have all those nests, nests over there um, around Lake Merritt as well. Um, so a lot of people go in and take photos of the black crowned night herons. But yeah, you can see pelicans, egrets, mallards, coots. Finally, we get to a raccoon, a non bird. Um, but then we're back to birds with, with uh, Canada goose and uh, double crested cormorants, great egrets, and then a squirrel is our next, as our, our top 10 there. Um, but yeah, you can see. So it's not necessarily what's the most abundant thing at Lake Merritt, but you, you can imagine it's like what people are interested in taking photos of, what people are, what are kind of easier things to take photos of. Those black crowned night herons when they're sitting up in the tree or sitting you know, still at the edge of a lake is a relatively easy thing to take a photo of um, and what people are interested in as well. So birds are, are a really big drop, obviously, for folks at Lake Merritt. Go back over here. Um, so management, like I said, is one of the other uses of iNaturalist data. We've talked about the big data side, answering big science questions about people who use it to better understand a place. And then the cool thing is about iNaturalist is that when you have, you know, two million people around the world documenting the things that they see around them, you are bound to find things that you were not expecting, things that are like new to science or like showing up in places that we didn't know they were there. Um, so I wanted to give you yet, yet another example um, from Oakland. This actually was taken during one of the City Nature Challenge events that Phoenix, um, when she was introducing me, talked about at the City Nature Challenge back in 2018. So some folks were over um, near the Japanese garden in Lake Merritt and they found these really interesting worms um, and took some photos of it. And like, if you look at this, here's a kind of the whole worm. This, these worms have this really interesting kind of head, like almost like a hammerhead um, like that. And so they took some good photos and they uploaded them to iNaturalist. And you can see on iNaturalist, um, the person who uploaded this observation, they said, okay, I think it's like a broadhead planarian. I'm gonna put it in this genus. Um, but then someone who actually doesn't even live anywhere in, in Oakland, I don't even think he lives in the US, weighed in and they said, actually, I think it's this other species, this other uh, hammerhead worm, this, uh, you can see it's a very similar genus name, but I think it's this other species. And then he actually starts talking about why he, why he thinks this is a really interesting observation that never been reported in the US before, um, where these species are from, you know, the other species that he knows are in the US. Um, and that he thinks, and then he has, as he goes in and zooms in on the observation, you can see that it's being, that it was made near Lake Merritt near the Japanese garden. He's like, oh, these are actually native to Japan. Maybe it came over with a plant um, for the garden itself. But this person obviously is not familiar with the area and is just kind of taking information by what he uh, is seeing in the observation itself. 
Um, and so some other folks weighed in based on this information and said, oh yeah, I do think it is this other species. So now this is a research grade observation of this hammerhead worm that was literally the first observation in the entire United States that was made over in Lake Merritt, um, which is super interesting. And so this is a really good example that when you just have a lot of people out there making observations, you're gonna find these unexpected things that you just didn't know were there, uh, which is pretty cool. And this is one of the other uh, uses of iNaturalist data, kind of the most fun use of iNaturalist data, but one of the, few, one of the uh, less common uses. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca to talk a little bit more about how we get people actually using iNaturalist. You know, that you've, now we've kind of given you an overview of what iNaturalist is, how to use it, what are the data used for. Rebecca's gonna dive in a little bit more into how we actually get people involved in using it. Um, and then what connections we think we might see between uh, the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy and iNaturalist and the types of work that we do. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca to start talking. Awesome, thanks Allison. And before I start talking about the, the work that we do, um, I wanted to have one more quiz. So we talked about um, what were the most commonly seen things at Lake Merritt, but this is just all of the observations from all of Oakland. So you can see there've been about 80, almost 80,000 observations made by just over 6,000 people throughout Oakland and almost 4,000 species, which is a lot of species. It's an amazing to think um, of all the diversity um, that we have in our cities. Um, so what do you all think is the most observed thing in all of Oakland? You can do the same thing. You can write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Any ideas? Fennel, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. Seagulls. Seagulls again. All right, okay, Allison, let's see what it is. Allison's driving, so she has to pull it up. All right, black crown night heron again, because as you all know, um, those black crown night herons are not just found around Lake Merritt, they're found other places throughout Oakland and a lot of birds, um, but also monarchs um, and slender salamanders and western fence lizards and coast live oaks. Um, mix in with those birds and mammals. Um, so I always like looking at this um, for places that I know really well and also for places that I'm going just to see what people are observing most. All right, so um, in the work that Allison and I do, one of the main things, kind of like the bread and butter of our work is um, holding events called bio blitzes. And bio blitzes are when we get a bunch of people together in one place to document as much biodiversity, as much nature, as many species as possible in a given amount of time. So, you know, obviously we didn't do much of this during COVID and we're still just taking baby steps back into a um, meeting in person. So all of these pictures are from before the pandemic. Um, so we always, almost always work in partnership with land managers, with the folks that um, take care of parks and open spaces and we put the word out and we get a bunch of different people from as many different partners, from nonprofit partners, from community-based organizations in the area, from our park, park partners. And we say, hey, come to this park, you know, at nine o'clock, we're all gonna work together and we're gonna take as many pictures of as many different species as we can. And we spread out through the park and we do that work together. We look, we're curious, we try to document as many different things um, as we can. And when we do this work, we don't, it's not really like a nature walk, right? Like I know most of you, many of you have been, especially in this class have been on nature walks, right? We're birding walk and you're learning from an expert about all the birds, which is super awesome. Um, but this is a little bit different. There are lots of experts kind of intermixed um, within the groups, but we divide, instead of dividing by plants and birds, um, we divide the park up into different areas and we all go out and explore each different area. We found this is a really good way to encourage people to be curious on their own and not just wait for that expert leader to point out each bird or each plant. And we all then, even the experts, get to have moments of like awe and wonder and discovering something new and learning from each other. Um, so this is what we do at our bio blitzes. So when we're out there, this is a, an example, a screenshot. 
of all of the observations we made during a bio blitz at Candlestick Point State Park, um, which is in San Francisco. And you can see all of these little orangish red dots are all of the observations that people participating in the bio blitz made. All right, next. And when you make a project, when you run bio blitzes, you can set up a project in iNaturalist. And Allison's gonna show us how to do that in just a minute. But what it does is it, you saw that boundary of Candlestick um, State Park in the previous slide. And it was just showing us the observations that were just made in that area in the time that we were holding our bio blitz. And 1300 observations. Oops, can you all still hear me? Hold on. My, you can still hear me, right? Okay, so it shows us that 1300 people, or 62 people made 1300 observations of about 250 species. And it gives us a, a leaderboard. So we can see who made the most observations, who observed the most species, and what were the most observed species during that time. And this is really fun. Some people are really motivated by competition, like seeing themselves on the top of the list. Um, some people are really happy to like want to see see as many species as they can, and other people want to make see make as many observations as they can. Um, and it just helps us um, learn and see together what we all did. And after we explore, we always come back together to go over the results and go over what we did um, in one space, so we can share our most exciting finds um, and learn from each other even more. All right, next, Allison. So we just held a BioBlitz um, just this week as part of California Biodiversity Day. Right now, actually, we're in the middle of the week, almost at the end, actually, of um, the state celebrating California Biodiversity Week. Um, and so on September 7th, we went out with a group of folks um, to Point Melati in um, Richmond and explored in the intertidal. So you can see um, kind of this is just like you can see like what a BioBlitz looks like. Um, so here, oh, it's a little slow coming in for me. Here is everyone exploring at the low tide, um, making, taking photos and looking for all the different cool things we could find um, on the, along the shoreline. And um, here are all the observations we made. We made just, we made a fair number of observations. It was about 27 people. And it was, we met at 6.30 in the morning, the Tuesday after Labor Day. So these are some pretty motivated people who really wanted to explore this really special place. Um, I encourage any of you to go out and check out this beach park if you haven't been there. It's just amazing. Um, so we made about 600 observations and you can see that same leaderboard here. One of the most observed things that we saw was this amazing little sea slug um, that was just beautiful and like a really great unexpected find for us. All right, next slide. So now we're gonna stop sharing and Allison is, will show you all how to make a BioBlitz project in iNaturalist. And, and what she's going to do is actually make a BioBlitz project for MLK Shoreline Park, where you all will be, I think in a couple weeks. Um, so when you're out there, you can make observations and they'll be automatically, so I should have said this is all automatic, they'll be automatically um, uploaded into this project that Allison will make. And just to be clear, what Allison will show you right now, anyone can do. <laughs> so that's why she's showing it because any of you can do this. Right, and so as we are thinking about like what are the connections between our work and what you guys are doing that, you know, if someone's still thinking about a project that you could do, like potentially holding a bio blitz, it could be a really interesting project to get a bunch of people to go to one of the places you visited and make a bunch of observations. So we just wanted to show how easy it is to make a project in iNaturalist that would automatically pull everyone's observations together. Um, so this is my view when I naturalist. Everyone has a home screen when you when you go to the website. As long as you're logged in, it's just showing me that I'm called Kestrel on iNaturalist, and it's showing me some observations of people I follow and places that I follow. But if you go up here to this community uh, tab up here, there's a thing called projects right there. It's going to take me to the projects page. It's showing me some um, recent projects that people have done. But you can see up here, there's a button that says start a project. Uh, so I can sit uh, hit that button. And it's going to show me two different types of projects, a collection project, which is basically um, 
uh, a way to pull in a bunch of observations that kind of fit a bunch of that fit particular rules that you make. Um, and this is what we use for BioBlitz projects. Um, or there's a thing called umbrella projects, which is basically a project that puts a bunch of projects together. So you don't want to make one of those if you're holding a BioBlitz, just a collection project is what you need. So you can sit, um, get started right here. Um, you want to give your project a name. Um, so it's putting, giving me some, some uh, options based on things I have put in before. We can do the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy, um, MLK Shoreline Park. Um, since we know you guys are going out there. Can someone tell me, I know you guys are going out there. What, I know you're out there this month. What day are you guys going out there so we can make sure we put the right rules of this project in there? Saturday, September 25th. Okay, the 25th, perfect. Um, so you can put a project name, uh, you have these optional things, you can give your project a banner, like when Rebecca showed the Point Melati that had a photo of, of the beach and stuff like that. These are optional things you can add in, but you don't have to, so I'm not gonna put them in right now. But if someone wants to, I'm happy to give uh, folks admin access to this project. Um, you can do a little project summary. September 25th, 2021. Let's see what we can find. Really basic, you have to put a little something in there at least. Um, you can see the project type is a collection project. And this is how, when we get into these observation requirements, this is how iNaturalist is gonna know to pull any observations that you guys make um, at MLK Shoreline Park on September 25th into this project. So it's saying, okay, what are the requirements of this project? Like, are there just particular types of organisms you're interested in, like just birds or just plants? In this case, I'm gonna leave this totally open so you guys can make observations of anything you want when you go out there. Um, but this is a really important one, this places tab, because we want your observations um, from MLK Shoreline Park. So if I put, if I start typing it in, Martin Luther, oh, so you can see the very first thing that comes up right here is Martin Luther King Jr. Regional Shoreline. So I'm gonna choose that as my place. So it knows that's one of my rules that has to be made in that place. Um, I could, it's asking me, you know, do you only wanna use, only wanna include particular users? I'm not gonna deal with that right now because um, as you guys go out there and make observations, they'll automatically get uploaded. So I don't need to just restrict it to you. Um, you can do this thing called project members only where people join the project and only their observations show up as well. I'm not going to deal do, uh, bother with that either. I'm just going to make it for MLK Shoreline Park on September 25th because that's the day you're going to be there. If other people happen to go out to that park that day and make iNaturalist observations, their observations will show up in this project too. That's all right. Um, but I'm guessing most likely since we're only going to make this on one day um, that it's mostly going to be if any of you make observations on the day that you go out there that are going to show up in this project. Um, so you can see you can restrict things around data quality or the media type, but we're just going to leave those at the defaults right now. Um, and this is the other really important thing, the date that's observed. Right now, if I made the project as it is, it's going to show me, it's going to make a project with all the observations from MLK Shoreline Park. But what we want are the observations that you guys are going to make on that one day. So I'm going to tell it, yes, I want a rule. I want an exact date. So September 25th, when you guys go out there. So now iNaturalist knows the rules of this project or that it has to be made in MLK Shoreline Park and it has to be made on September 25th. But now any observations that are made in that park on the 25th will automatically get pulled into this project. Hmm. Um, you can see I'm an admin on this project right now. Um, if anyone else wants to take control of it, I'm happy to make other people an admin of this project. You can email me later if you're interested in, in taking ownership of this project. But right now I'm gonna hit this is done. And it's going to take it a sec and save it, and it's going to take me back out to the main project page. Slowly. <laughs> and that has been very slow for me lately, making projects. Slowly, maybe, maybe you're going to make, out, make it out to that page. There we go. <laughs> so now you can see it has the title of the project that I put there. Um, like I said, I could have put a banner if I had had a photo ready to go. I could have put that up there, uh, but those things can also get added out late, added, added later. Uh, but you can see it's telling us it's September 25th. It says, okay, this bio blitz begins in 13 days. You know, it's gonna kind of gives you a countdown for when it's gonna start. 
And this again are like the rules so that anyone who looks at this project knows what the rules are, that it has to be made at MLK Regional Shoreline in Oakland. And it has to be made, that observation has to be made on September 25th. And here's the map right here. And um, when you guys are out there on the 25th, this project is gonna switch over to an active project. And any observations you make on the 25th will show up in this project right here. But you can see it's super simple making a project on iNaturalist. Um, so now I'm gonna go back to our project here. So that's one connection um, that we thought between the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy and the type of work is, that we do is that anyone can make a project. So if any of you are interested in holding a bio blitz, it's a really easy thing to do on iNaturalist and bring people together to make observations at one place at one time. Um, another thing that we can do on iNaturalist is actually look at existing data. Um, so this might be, uh, Phoenix is telling me that some of you guys are really interested in um, uh, looking at uh, native species in particular places. Oh, and I can see Phoenix has a question about, uh, do you have to make it on the website or can you do it in the app? You need to make a project on the website itself um, or go to, yeah, I mean, you can go to the website on your phone and make the project too, um, but it's way, the app doesn't give you the ability in the app to make projects. The app is like a very, like, sh very shrunken window into iNaturalist and the website is really where you do all, most of the main functionality on iNaturalist. Um, so yeah, so those of you who might be interested in looking at data that's already been collected on iNaturalist, um, that's a really easy thing to do. Um, Middle Harbor Shoreline Park, I know that you all went there um, last month. Um, so this is showing you that lots of places are already made on iNaturalist, um, including most of the parks that you guys are visiting um, as part of the class. Um, so here's Middle Harbor Shoreline Park. You can see there's been about 1800 observations made here. Oh, and I can turn it back over to Rebecca. Sorry, I just like started, kept, kept going. <laughs> I do have a question. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, ask a question. Okay. Uh, I am, have downloaded the iNaturalist app. Now, this project that we're going to be doing at uh, Martin Luther King uh, Regional Shoreline, am I automatically tied into this iNaturalist uh, uh, stuff that you are setting up. And if I make observations that day from my app, am I going to be definitely on, on your on your screen or whatever? Yeah, one hundred percent. So if since Allison made that project to say any observations made at Martin Luther King Shoreline Park on September twenty fifth will be automatically included in that project, then if you are out there with your phone logged in and you share observations, they will be shared in that project and they'll make little dots like you can see on this screen. Um, and so will everybody else's. Thank you. Sure. All right, Rebecca. Back yeah, to I guess, Sorry. I mean, Allison, I can take over. I just have a couple of slides. I mean, this is just, so like Allison said, um, these are all of the observations that have already been made at Middle Harbor Shoreline Park. And, um, you were out there last month and you know there are already so even places that if you all are thinking about ways to learn more about the shoreline or to encourage others to learn more about the shoreline at all these different parts like people have already made some observations so you can see this is a just a little screenshot of um, the actual observations that people have made along um, Middle Harbor Shoreline Park so if I wanted to know, like, what are the things that, what have people seen there? Um, you can see all everyone's pictures. And by doing events like a bio blitz or doing, um, encouraging people to make and share iNaturalist observations, you can add to the, the knowledge we have about these different places. And sometimes, so here's Martin Luther King, um, the Shoreline Park, where you will be on the 25th. And there already have been, and this is a great place to see, see wildlife. So there already have been a, a fair number of observations made there, um, lots of birds again. Um, but this is a really great way to think about like before you might hold an event and after, you know, you can search iNaturalist and Allison will show this just in a little bit about how to find these data that we're showing you right now. You can look and see, you know, how many observations of which species were made before my event. And then you can hold your event and then you can look at how um, your event changes our understanding of those places. Um, and because you can um, search um, iNaturalist based on lots of different parameters. 
because, and I think one of the things that's important to remember is that we're using these places right now, these basically like these shapes on iNaturalist as a way to search all of the data on iNaturalist. So like Allison showed you, there are almost 80 million observations on all of iNaturalist. And when we ask it to show us what's been found at Martin Luther King Jr. Regional Park, it just limits our view of what's been, um, what's been shared on all of iNaturalist to just show us this part. Um, so with that, Allison will open up her computer, her like, browser again and show you how to find those existing data. Yeah, and I see there's some questions in the, in the chat about duplicate observations and things like that. Um, it's not really a problem. iNaturalist never really, uh, it's not really there to document abundance of things. It's really like, it's about species occurrence, right? Like these species occur in this place. Um, and so it's actually totally fine. Like if someone sees something really cool and everyone wants to take a photo of it because they want to have a record that they saw it, that's totally fine. And iNaturalist then is going to say this species occurs here in this place, you know, but here's how many observations of it have been made. Uh, but it's totally fine if um, there's multiple observations of the same organism made by multiple people. Um, that's totally fine with iNaturalist. Um, so yeah, if we want to look at particular places, I just wanted to show you guys really quickly, like how do you, how do you find that data that Rebecca was just showing you? Um, so here we're back on the kind of the main uh, iNaturalist page that, you know, it'll look different when you log in, it'll have your picture and your name right here, but there's this explore um, button up here. And if I tap that explore button, it takes me, iNaturalist, I've told iNaturalist that I, um, my place is California, that I live in California. So it automatically shows me all the observations made in California when I hit that explore button. Most folks, if you haven't set that on iNaturalist, it'll just show you all the observations made around the whole world. Um, but this search bar up here next to uh, the iNaturalist name up at the top is a great way to look for places that have already been made in iNaturalist. Um, so I can type in up here, I'll go back to Martin Luther King. And again, you can see one of the very first things that comes up is the regional shoreline. So if I tap that right here, what it's going to do, it's like Rebecca said, it's now just limiting. So they're showing me all the observations in California. It's saying, okay, now we're going to zone in um, on Martin Luther King Regional Shoreline Park. Um, and so that's, this is the exact same thing that we were showing in that slide right there. Um, showing you all the observations people have made, the different colors of the points just are different types of organisms, um, like blue are uh, things like vertebrates, like uh, mammals and birds, green are plants, orange are invertebrates, uh, pink is fungus, uh, and lichen and stuff like that. And so if I, like right now I'm looking at the map, but if I was really interested in the species people are finding here, you can see I can go over to the species tab right here and tap that, and now it's gonna show me all the species that people have uh, found based on all those observations. So that's 4,800 observations of 456 species. And again, it's showing me from most observed to least observed. And you can see, again, a, a place where a lot of people go and take photos of birds um, at MLK Regional Shoreline Park right here. But you can scroll down and you can see all um, the species. Really interestingly, if you're interested in knowing if something is native or non-native, if it doesn't have anything displayed um, on the photo itself, it's a species that's native. Uh, to our area, but as we scroll down, you're going to see some ob some photos have this little IN in the corner right here. This means this is an introduced species, so this is this is a non-native species that people have made observations of um, at MLK Junior Regional Shoreline Park. Um, and so you can get some information just by scrolling through this um, this species list. Here's more introduced species. Um, and as we scroll down more and more, we're seeing more and more introduced species. I was going to see if it's going to show us any of the other. You might see something in red with an E that's going to show you that that's an endangered species, like a rare endangered or threatened species. Um, most of the ones are not, we're only seeing introduced species. Um, or as you scroll through, you might see something with a little um, N in the corner, a little green N. Or, yeah, is it an N or is it an E? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's sometimes there's a little uh, little green square up in the corner and that's showing us things that are endemic to California. So species that um, uh, only occur in California. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to remember. Yeah. But in this, in this case, you can see um, mostly, mostly what it's showing us are introduced species. So things that are native that don't have that IN in there and then introduced species as well. 
Um, and so iNaturalist is, I saw the, yeah, that someone asked a question about, you know, is iNaturalist a reputable source to document what's in the area? It really is, especially because uh, lots of people are on there and can help, like I said, refine those identifications and help you actually get things down to species, which is great. Um, but it uses like reputable taxonomy and information about whether things are introduced or um, native as well. So it's a great source to get more information about the species uh, that you're seeing as well. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when we were at the middle labor shoreline, I took some pictures on uh, iNaturalist uh, of some plants. And it came back telling me unknown species. Does that mean, I mean, I don't know what that means. Unknown species, that means it does not recognize the plant I'm taking picture of. So usually if something shows up as unknown, um, it's because a suggestion, like you have to tap that, like, what did you see button to get those suggestions. And so if, you, if you're looking at um, observations on iNaturalist and you see something that says unknown, it means that there's just not an identification associated with it yet. Um, so things that you, you can upload to iNaturalist without putting any ID at all, and they, they stay unknown until someone goes in and looks at it and starts putting in identifications, like saying, this is a plant, or this is you know, a California poppy or something like that. So unknown doesn't mean that it's like a totally unknown species. It just means right now there's no identification associated with this observation. Um, so that's what that, the unknown means. All right, another picture that I took when we went to the new path uh, by the Bay Bridge, I would, I would expect that those plants around there are known. But uh, I just came back and said, by the Bay Bridge, they named the name of the plant. And that was the very first day that you went with us to that plant. So it's not giving me the name of that plant. So make sure you tap that there's a there's a field in there that you might have to go back in and maybe we can do this maybe we can uh, do this offline or after this um, we, there's a way to actually go in and edit those observations to actually get those suggestions and so I'm guessing what we need to do is just is do one more step to get those suggestions in there. Um, I see. Yeah, so I'm I'm happy to we just have a few more slides now, but then I can show share my screen again and show you the next step just to sh give an example of what happens. Just, just like show you the next, the one next step. If you're seeing an unknown, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do that in just a second. There, there was one other thing, um, functionality of iNaturalist that we wanted to point out, and this is something called guides. Um, and as you can see, there's a big note up here that there's no, like iNaturalist is not really fixing guides if there are problems with it, but it seems to be working fine for me and for Allison. So this might be a really nice tool for, um, for educating folks about what species are found in different places. So when you go to go to the guides page, um, you can create a guide or you can find existing guides. So I typed in just to see, I knew that there were some guides about Lake Merritt. And since I knew we were talking about Lake Merritt, there are these three different guides made about, about Lake Merritt and people just made these guides on their own. And it's very similar to making a project. We're not gonna walk you through it now, but you go to the guides page and if you wanna say create a guide, you can choose a place just like you did for the project and it will pull up all the observations that have ever been made in that place. And then for example, like this is when they made this a guide, they said Lake Merritt and they said, show me all the birds that have been seen there. And it will automatically make you this little guide that shows you the different species and you can change how this is, how this, information is displayed, but it'll show you a map of, see here's Lake Merritt. It can show you where pigeons have been seen or rock doves. Obviously they've been seen more places, but people that have uploaded them to iNaturalist. And then coots and then hummingbirds. And so you can make a guide for any place that you might be interested um, in educating or spreading the information about what species are found. And it doesn't have to be birds. It could be plants. It could be, um, you know, anything. In mollusks could be any anything, or it could just be everything that's seen there, and you can organize it. And this can be findable on the web, but you can also design or choose which way you might want to make a PDF, so you could print it out. So you can make a little book. You could imagine making one for a shoreline park or a place along the shoreline, 
and um, deciding what it might look like and then printing it and giving it to people at like a pop-up music, a pop-up visitor center or someplace that um, you might be communicating to people about what's found along the shoreline. And the great thing is, is you can use the photos from an iNaturalist, you can use information from Wikipedia and it will just automatically populate into a guide. So you don't have to type it all in on your own. And then if you don't like something that it might populate automatically, you can edit it. So it's actually a really, really great tool. Um, and I think it's a really fun um, thing to use when you're talking to people or educating people about um, either yourself or plants and animals that are found in places that you're interested in. And the last thing that we wanted to talk about is an opportunity or two different opportunities. Um, that we have at the Academy for you all to share the work that you're doing more widely. I know this is an important part of the Oakland Shoreline Leadership Academy. And so we've chatted with Phoenix about different things. You know, the Academy has a pretty big reach, a pretty big audience online and on per in person. And it would be fabulous if um, some of you are interested in communicating about the work that you are doing, what you've learned and why it's important to you um, on one of these channels. And so we have something called the Academy Breakfast Club, which is a, a chat that we host. Um, usually it's in the morning, um, either Tuesdays or Thursdays, but I think it's a little bit flexible. And um, it's live streamed on Facebook, and then it's also on YouTube. And we have lots of different subjects. We have things like tours behind the scenes at the Academy. We have um, panels of experts and scientists talking about the, the work that they do and community folks who talk about the work that they're doing around conservation and communicating climate change um, or whatever might be what we think actually might be really interesting to our members and followers on all things social media and platforms. So here's an example um, of maybe right around Shark Week, the last this time that Shark Week happened on TV, we hosted a panel, um, people talking about shark science, and you can see here we have Jasmine Graham here. She's a, a, a woman who studies sharks and she talked about her experience and she showed some videos and talked about everything that she did um, and or she does. And you can see there's you know, a big conversation that's happening with the folks that are watching and learning from her. And this is a pretty recent video, but there are about 428 views on our YouTube channel. But then there are a lot more people who watch it live on Facebook. Um, and this is usually hosted by um, someone on our digital engagement team who's like super awesome at interviewing folks and making them comfortable. And she handles all of the behind the scenes tech. And so you just have to come and talk about what you do. And we think it would be really great for the folks that, um, the folks that are interested in nature and biodiversity and climate change um, and communities to learn about the work that you're doing. So just know that this is an option if, if some of you are interested in communicating this way. And similarly, we have a program, some of you have maybe heard about nightlife, which is when um, folks that are 21 or over can come to our museum, you know, and have drinks and see the exhibits. But we also have something called night school, which is kind of like breakfast club, but it happens in the evening. And um, similarly, um, folks come and give talks about the work that they're doing. This is, a, this is one that was called Extreme Science. And so this woman was talking about wildfires and you know, showing slides, talking about the work that she's doing. And almost 2000 people um, watch the YouTube of this. It's a pretty hot topic, right? No pun intended. There, it's just a lot of people are really interested in extreme science. And you can see that you know, this, this, because it's online, it gets this huge audience. And so on the right side, you can see they asked people to say where they were from. And it was people from all over the world and all over the country um, tuning in. And so this is another option if, if you all are interested in communicating about your work um, at, night, at night school. So just let Phoenix know and we can make the connections to make that happen. And we just wanted to share our contact information with you um, is our emails, our Twitter, and our iNaturalist um, handles, so you can find us there. And also our website, um, which is just Cal Academy Community Science. Um, if you put that in Google, you'd be able to find us without having to remember that. 
Um, and I know we're pretty much at time, so I want to be respectful of everybody else's time. I wanted to, to show, to share my screen and talk a little bit about how to change things from unknown to, to make sure that you're, you're using the, um, the suggestions. But if anybody else has any questions before we do that, we'd be happy to take those questions now. Or if we need to move, I don't know if um, you guys have something right at three either. Right. If we need to, we can also send send information via email also about moving things from unknowns to knowns. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If someone else is coming. <laughs> we do have a three o'clock presentation, but it, maybe if we just had one question. Well, yeah, if any of you are interested in any of the things that we talked about or want to think more about how, you know, the work that we're doing or using iNaturalist could be incorporated in a project that you're doing or even beyond um, what you're doing in the academy, you know, feel free to reach out to Phoenix and she can connect you with us. Or if you wrote down our contact information, we're happy to take um, emails directly as well. But um, we're really excited about the work that you guys are doing. And we hope that some of you might uh, be interested in the overlap of the types of work that we do too. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Thanks Alice. So much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.